Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar today with Dr. Soham Rej. Dr. Rej is a geriatric psychiatrist and assistant professor of psychiatry at McGill University in Montreal. Soham's research has focused on the physical, cognitive, and mental health of older adults with bipolar disorder and has been published in more than 60 peer-reviewed publications. Soham completed his medical school and psychiatric residency at McGill University, followed by a geriatric psychiatry fellowship at University of Toronto. Today, Dr. Raj will discuss origins, treatment options, and special considerations for bipolar disorder in older adults. Welcome, Dr. Raj. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Debbie, and thank you all for uh, for attending. So. I guess I'll start us up. Um, just, I guess, one slide to say, uh, please feel free to support the International Bipolar Foundation and the great work that they do um, to help people around the world with bipolar disorder. Um, in terms of my disclosures, um, I do research, so I get a number of uh, grants from a bunch of, um, um, I, I live in Canada, so I get Canadian governmental and provincial grants. Um, but I don't have any commercial interests. And a big thing I want to emphasize is that today's talk is not a replacement for a professional consultation with your doctor. Uh, this is more information uh, both for uh, uh, patients or people with bipolar disorder, their families, and healthcare professionals who want to know more about how to, uh, how, what treatment options are out there for people with uh, bipolar disorder who are now getting to older age. Um, so then a big question that people might have is, uh, so what helps in older age? So uh, I'm going to give you guys a, a vignette. Uh, this is um, an 82-year-old man with uh, diabetes, um, high blood pressure, and a lot of medications uh, for a number of physical problems. And previously, this person benefited from using a medication called lithium but because of an, uh, an adverse effect or because of other problems, couldn't continue taking lithium because of the kidney issues. And now this man is currently using an antipsychotic medication, uh, which is a type of medication sometimes used in bipolar disorder. Um, but he's having depressive symptoms right now. So what may potentially help this patient? Um, this person may uh, would this person improve with the change in medication, with psychotherapy, with some social support, like from the, the community, or some support from uh, his family or caregiver, or some or all of the above? And I guess in this case, you'd say it depends. Every case of um, bipolar disorder, every person's story, every person's symptoms, they're all different. So some or all of these may help this person. So I guess I'm not sure what everyone's uh, level of comfort is with, with this diagnosis, so I just start from the basic. Um, bipolar disorder uh, comes in two main types um, in, in what's called the DSM-5, that Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5. Big word, basically what it means uh, is it's how psychiatrists around the world uh, um, label diagnoses, and these are just labels. The idea behind the label of bipolar disorder is really only to uh, to tell people, okay, there are a bunch of symptoms that this person has, and these treatments are likely to help this person go back to living uh, a happy and healthy life as much as possible. So that's it's it's a label. That's what I want to emphasize. But it's it's only as helpful as it helps people get to recovery and live a good life. So bipolar disorder type 1 uh, involves someone having at least one manic episode. Uh, what that means is having three out of seven symptoms of a, of a high, and I'll describe that very soon, lasting more than seven days. There's also bipolar disorder type 2. Here someone can have what's called a hypomanic episode. So the same number of symptoms, three out of seven, lasting for four days or more. And, um, and, and with that, they also have to have a history of having one depressive episode. So two weeks of having five out of nine of a number of symptoms, which I'll also describe. 
So for both types of bipolar disorder, though, depression and what we call cognitive symptoms, so there's memory, but there's also decision making and speed of thinking, those can all, all those are actually the most impairing symptoms for bipolar disorder, especially in older age. And so what are symptoms of mania? Uh, and these are from the National Institute of Mental Health has this uh, nice kind of list to give people an idea of what kind of symptoms people can have. So if you have uh, mania, you would need to have three out of seven of these for uh, at least one week or more. So symptoms like feeling very up or high, uh, not needing to sleep, uh, becoming more active than usual, uh, talking really fast about a lot of different things, uh, being agitated, irritable, or touchy, uh, feeling like uh, your thoughts are going very fast, or doing risky things like spending a lot of money. Um, and here's what symptoms of depression look like. Uh, so if someone has a depression, they would need to have uh, five out of uh, nine of these for um, two weeks or more. So feeling very down or sad, uh, sleeping too much or too little. Uh, usually in in depression, people can sleep, sometimes sleep too much. In, in bipolar disorder depression, uh, it kind of often presents the opposite as bipolar mania, but it can go either way, depending on the person. Um, they can, people can also feel like they can't enjoy anything. They may have the feeling of being worried and empty having trouble concentrating, eating too much or too little, uh, feeling tired or slowed down, and thinking about death or suicide. So those are the kinds of symptoms people can have when they're depressed. So here's some facts about bipolar disorder in older adults. And by older adults, generally we talk about people who are 60 and up, which nowadays we would say uh, 60 is the new 40. So not that old, but uh, that's what we mean by older adults in this talk. So about 0.5 to 1 percent, so about one in every hundred people uh, who are above 60 have bipolar disorder, and by 2030, more than 50 percent of people who have bipolar disorder will be older than 60. It's because the world is, uh, is getting older um, on average. So amongst the people with, um, with mental illness who are older than 60, uh, people with bipolar disorder tend to need a lot of psychiatric and physical health services, um, both for bipolar disorder, which can sometimes be uh, very difficult to, to manage in terms of uh, getting the kind of stability that we would like, although there are often cases where people can uh, get to stability and, and live uh, happy and healthy lives. Um, and then there's also physical health problems. So those are very common. And so because of those reasons, uh, people with bipolar disorder who are uh, older tend to be, uh, tend to use a, a lot of mental health and physical health services and tend to need them. And um, one thing to remember though, even though we're talking about older adults with bipolar disorder, only about 5 to 10 percent of people older than 60 with bipolar disorder uh, had bipolar disorder uh, starting late in life. So most people actually uh, had early onset. They started having bipolar disorder in, in their 20s, for example. And then there's something called cognitive dysfunction. So uh, about 30 percent of people with uh, bipolar disorder who are older have cognitive dysfunction. Um, what that means is trouble with decision making, trouble with processing speed, so kind of like slowness, uh, trouble with uh, memory uh, relating to kind of visual stuff such as driving. Those are the main areas, although stuff like memory and language can also be affected. Um, so those are quite impairing, like even if we don't have depressive symptoms, even if we don't have uh, uh, manic or hypomanic symptoms, uh, we can often have some of these uh, memory issues or cognitive issues like decision-making that continue to last. 
Then there's physical health comorbidity. So an average uh, person with bipolar disorder who is older has three to four physical health problems. And this is a big issue because compared to the general population, people with bipolar disorder have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, um, stuff like heart attack and stroke. And that uh, translates to about 15 years less life expectancy, although there are some trends that might be starting to change with better management of health. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons for that. One is uh, bipolar disorder itself associated with these physical health problems. Also, if we have bipolar disorder, um, people with bipolar disorder, because of the illness, may be more likely to engage in um, stuff like smoking or uh, other substances or unhealthy diet, which can be also associated with um, cardiovascular problems and less life expectancy. Um, there's also the medication itself used to treat bipolar disorder. Some of them are associated with weight gain, and we'll get into that. There's also the issue with medication tolerability. So as we get older, we can have physical uh, health issues and have a number of medications at the same time, which can lead to drug-drug interactions. So those are some facts and some issues uh, that are kind of unique, in a way, to um, bipolar disorder in older adults, as opposed to bipolar disorder earlier in life. So what are the symptoms of bipolar disorder in older adults versus younger adults? So overall, mania is pretty similar to mania in, in younger people. Um, uh, when people have delusions, so for example, uh, we talked about mania, we talked about depression. Sometimes in mania, and even sometimes in depression, people can have what we call psychosis. Uh, what that means is they can be very, they can have a belief, a very strong belief in something, but then all the people around them don't have this belief. Um, for example, they could be very scared of someone, or they could think that they're invincible, or um, they can have no harm in a manic episode, when in fact they may be doing things that are very risky because of this belief that other people around them don't share. Um, there's also having hallucinations, um, stuff like hearing voices that other people can't hear or seeing things that other people can't see. Um, so those kind of things can happen, but they're less likely in older adults with bipolar disorder. And older adults may be more prone to having depression. And keeping in mind depression and cognitive dysfunction, so memory issues and trouble making decisions, those are probably the most disabling aspects of well, in older adults with bipolar disorder. So why do people uh, get bipolar disorder in older age? So like we were talking about, most people get bipolar disorder earlier in life. Uh, only 5 to 10% get it after age 50. And the biology of bipolar disorder isn't very clear, but uh, their idea is that there's genetic factors, so a family history of bipolar disorder or depression or schizophrenia or other mental illness seems to be associated with a higher risk of bipolar disorder. Um, there's been some research showing that some brain changes um, and that stress and what we call inflammation, so our immune response, uh, may be uh, associated with having a risk for bipolar disorder. And then in the people who are older than 50 who do get bipolar disorder, they tend to have a different profile. They tend to have more, even more cardiovascular risk. They tend to have more neurological problems and health problems and more cognitive issues. But again, those are, that's the minority of cases who are um, maybe 5%, 10% started having bipolar after age 50. Most people have it much earlier in life. So then there are a whole number of conditions that can mimic bipolar disorder in older adults. And uh, you know, if with your healthcare professional, uh, they can they can try to rule out some of these these conditions. So for example, people can have depression that's not bipolar, but just the unipolar major depressive disorder. Uh, people can have schizophrenia or another type of psychosis called schizoaffective disorder. Uh, some people can have dementia, 
um, and have symptoms that look like mania but are actually due to uh, a memory or a, what we call a neurodegenerative disease. Um, people can have delirium, so they can have confusion because of a medical condition. And other people can have issues related to substances um, like alcohol or drugs or of medication, which can give symptoms that look like bipolar disorder. So it's important to really screen for these kind of um, other, like if there's a new uh, diagnosis of bipolar disorder, it's important that your physician looks into these different uh, possibilities. Um, so the first time anyone gets assessed for bipolar disorder, there should be a good history about psychiatric care and symptoms in the past, um, uh, a history of for medical problems, for neurological problems, and of, of treatments, like what has worked, what hasn't worked, to get an idea of what may help this person in the future. And um, examining the mental status is very important, so to screen for cognitive and memory issues. Uh, so there's a, a test called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, for example, and that's like a 15-minute test that can screen for a lot of these. So that's an example, but your doctor may have another screen, which could be good. Um, there's also examining the nerves and the body for, for weight, blood pressure, and waist circumference, because often those, that, those are cardiovascular risk factors that can contribute to increase medical problems and uh, risk of mortality. So those are things to just make sure we have a good uh, assessment of and uh, make sure people are healthy. Then on top of that, you might have a bunch of blood tests, both for diagnosis to make sure, well, wait, is this bipolar disorder or are there other medical problems contributing to the issue? Um, and also in terms of planning treatment, because some of the medications have specific uh, adverse effects, uh, which we'll get to later. So things that are important to check are like thyroid, uh, blood cells, uh, liver function, kidney function, electrolytes, uh, calcium, folate, vitamin B12, and in some cases uh, an electrocardiogram, uh, which checks the heart. And in some cases people may need to have what we call neuroimaging or a brain scan. Uh, this is more in the minority of cases that have uh, a very quick and late onset, say above the age of 50, uh, without previous history of bipolar disorder. So one thing I want to emphasize is that what I've listed is an ideal assessment. And we know that health professionals all around the world, and I've talked to them, uh, a lot of them from different places, and things are often very busy um, in clinics. And so not like all of these may not necessarily be uh, relevant to your case. Um, and it, it also, it's kind of a balance between, on the one hand, giving, you know, being able to hear a person's story and to be able to find out all the information that's relevant to you while also doing as much of a workup as possible. So it's not that everyone has to do the assessment I've listed here, but it's more these are suggestions that are in the ideal case. And then based on your specific case, um, your clinician can kind of tailor uh, this kind of assessment to your, your needs and what will help you most. So now I'll go over a bit of an overview of the main medications used in older uh, adults who have bipolar disorder. Although there hasn't been as much research specifically in older adults, as a rule of thumb, most medications that work in younger adults also work in older adults. Usually, lower doses are better tolerated, although sometimes similar doses are needed for treatment effectiveness. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that although some medications are helpful to some people, they may not necessarily be as helpful to others. So everyone has their own medication that may help for them. 
and and uh, unfortunately at this point we can't predict before someone takes a pill which pill will help them. Hopefully one day we'll be able to do that. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So there's this medication called lithium. It's been around since um, the 50s and 60s. And it's the best study medication for older age bipolar disorder. Um, it's the gold standard. And it's helpful in mania, depression, and in maintaining remission from mood symptoms, mood symptoms being mania and depression. Uh, so lithium can be effective in up to 40% of patients with um, older age bipolar disorder. There's some evidence that lithium might have protective effects against suicide and against dementia, although there's still more research being done. Uh, one thing about lithium is that although it can be effective in many patients, it needs careful monitoring for kidney, neurological, and endocrinological effects. So endocrine meaning hormones. So the lithium levels that are often helpful in depression range in geriatrics range from 0.4 to 0.6, while with mania you might end up having 0.4 to 0.8. So these levels are a compromise between the one hand effectiveness and on safety. So geriatrics these levels are a bit lower than what someone might end up using in people who are who are younger with with bipolar disorder. Um, if possible, I suggest to clinicians to avoid uh, using lithium levels more than 0.8, if possible. Um, but there are often cases where levels above 0.8 are needed. So this is really on a case by case basis, and and uh, your clinician can can talk to you about what the right level for you is if you happen to be on lithium. Uh, a rule of thumb is to monitor lithium levels and kidney functions every three months. Um, this is a good way to prevent uh, problems. This, this, is, this rule of every three months is particularly helpful in geriatrics. But of course, we understand that in some places, every three months is hard. So if not every three months, at least every six months is very helpful to prevent long-term kidney problems and to be able to stay on the medication as long as possible. Often what, what I hear is patients, a good number of patients have benefited from lithium. The reason they have to stop is because of kidney problems. So good monitoring both of the lithium levels and of kidney function is a great way to prevent problems and if the medication has been helpful to stay on it. Another thing I suggest is whenever someone is started on a blood pressure or anti-inflammatory medication. Um, so for example, like like Advil or ibuprofen. Um, uh, in those circumstances, it's nice to check the lithium level uh, and kidney function again five to seven days after, just to make sure that um, that kidney function hasn't hasn't been affected and because the reason why we do that is those medications, blood pressure medications and anti-inflammatory medications, can sometimes increase the risk of um, lithium toxicity, can increase the lithium level. But a lot of patients are on these pills. If we're taking lithium, we may also need to take a blood pressure pill or an anti-inflammatory pill. Um, but it's just when there's a change in any of those pills or there's a new pill, uh, within a week, it would be nice to repeat the lithium level and kidney function uh, for safety. So then there's valproate. Valproate is also has had a long history of use, and it's effective in mania, depression, and maintenance of bipolar disorder. It has the second most amount of research studying and supporting its use in people who are older with uh, bipolar disorder. There's some drawbacks of valproate. Some people believe it to be less effective than lithium. There's a bit of a higher risk of cognitive dysfunction or memory uh, kind of issues. And uh, there are a number of potential side effects, so like weight gain, which can also happen with lithium. Um, but diabetes mellitus is with valproate. Uh, sedation, so being tired, is common. 
having nausea or tremor can be common. Um, there can also be um, gait disturbance, so difficulties with walking. Uh, sometimes people can get delirium or confusion and hair loss. But the last few things I said were less common. The common things are really weight gain and feeling sleepy. Um, but then I personally, as a, because I'm, I'm a psychiatrist, and I have a lot of patients on Valproate as well. Um, and they have many patients benefit from Valproate. And um, just because these are potential side effects doesn't mean everyone gets it. Uh, unfortunately, the only way to know if someone will get a side effect or not is to try the medication. Um, but stuff like weight gain, diabetes, and um, the trouble with feeling sleepy, uh, that stuff is reversible. So if you're ever in a position where you have symptoms of mania or depression and your, your clinician is kind of saying, well, this is something that may help you in your specific case, um, it's, a, it's a balance because one having, you know, being in remission or having the symptoms of, let's say, mania or depression being adequately treated is actually really important. It, it's associated with less mortality. It's associated with better quality of life. Um, people can actually go on and live their lives better. So it's balancing that need um, to have a healthy and happy life, which medication can be one part of and can get people back to that. And balancing that with the side effects, which don't necessarily happen with each patient who takes it, it's just a risk that you need to know about and that you balance with the potential positive effects. So then there's lamotrigine. So lamotrigine is a, a first-line medication for bipolar depression. Um, and there, there have been some promising effects found in a recent larger study of older adults. Uh, unlike lithium and valproate, it has a nice positive kind of uh, aspect. It's relatively weight neutral. So people don't tend to gain weight with lamotrigine. And also it's associated with less cognitive side effects than valproate and some of the other medication I'll be telling you about. There are some potential drawbacks. So lamotrigine isn't effective in mania. Only in depression is it effective. And then there's a number of potential side effects, although most of these are pretty rare. Uh, so having low uh, sodium levels in the blood, uh, some hair loss, although hair loss can also happen with valproate and sometimes with lithium. Um, lamotrigine can also be associated with some skin conditions like psoriasis or acne. And then here's one thing that I, I should tell you about. Uh, there is, some people get a rash with, um, with lamotrigine. So about 5% of people can get a rash, and very few of these are serious. But if you see a rash, let your doctor know immediately to be safe, meaning it's like a rash plus a fever and then plus having some, some blood abnormalities, that's dangerous. But in the grand majority of people, even the people who get a rash, it can be safe. But if you are starting on the motrogene and you do notice a rash, just to be safe, let your doctor know right away. But overall, many patients use this medication and it can be very helpful for a depression and bipolar disorder. So then there's carbamazepine. So carbamazepine is effective in mania, depression, and maintenance. Um, there's more evidence suggesting its use in mania, but, it, but I've had uh, actually a good number of patients who've been stable for you know, decades on carbamazepine. So for some people, it, it really works. Um, uh, it's relatively weight neutral, so it doesn't tend to cause weight gain. And like I was mentioning, I've seen some patients who've been stable for decades on this pill. Um, there are some potential drawbacks. So there's very limited um, you know, data from studies or information from studies about carbamazepine. Um, there are multiple drug interactions with other medications. That's actually a big issue because as we get older, there's more more likely to have other medications for other physical health problems. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that grape, grapefruit juice, and that's why the picture of grapefruit is there, uh, increases carbamazepine level, so I would watch out for that. Um, and then there are other 
side effects that are relatively rare, so like low sodium levels, uh, having arrhythmias, so heart issues, um, rashes. Again, if you have a rash with carbamazepine, let your doctor know, and blood issues. So all of these are pretty rare, but I figured I would tell you about them uh, anyway. So then there's uh, atypical antipsychotics in bipolar disorder. So antipsychotics are commonly used medications for a number of um, mental health issues, uh, including bipolar disorder. And so there's some evidence for uh, medication called aripiprazole, uh, olanzapine, ketiapine, clozapine, risperdone, asenapine, and lorazidone in older adult bipolar disorder. And so um, there are a bunch of medications approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, uh, or FDA, for the treatment of bipolar mania in adults. And these include aripiprazole, asenapine, olanzapine, ketiapine, risperdone, and ziprazidone. And then there's a bunch of medications approved for bipolar depression, including lorazidone, ketiapine, and the combination of olanzapine with an antidepressant called fluoxetine. So um, there are potential side effects of atypical antipsychotics. Um, they can make people tired some people, depending on the dose. Um, same idea with, they can have something called orthostatic hypotension. So they can stand up really quickly and then feel dizzy. Sometimes standing up slowly can get rid of this issue. Um, or changing the dose. Those are other ways of, around it. Some people can have gait or movement issues. Um, some people can have tremor and stiffness. Um, some people can get weight gain or what's called metabolic syndrome. So weight gain and a number of issues like diabetes, cholesterol, and high blood pressure. Although some of these medications like lorazidone are more weight neutral, so they don't cause weight gain. Um, there, there is some controversy about uh, kidney problems with antipsychotics. That's been recently, there's some research on that. Um, there is a chance of uh, stroke, but th these chances are pretty low. As in, so for example, in a year, 1% of uh, older adults, even if they don't use any medication, will get um, you know, um, kind of a mortality. But uh, in people with dementia who use antipsychotics, and most people with bipolar disorder don't have dementia, but the, the most of, a lot of the research in antipsychotic safety in older adults has been with dementia patients. They found that people who use antipsychotics have maybe a 2% per year risk. So it's, it's always, I'm talking about, I listed a bunch of side effects. I don't want this to scare you. This is more just the list. Most of these effects happen in less than 5% of people. Uh, and often, lowering the dose can make it more safe. Um, and it can, often, working with your doctor, you can find kind of a balance between side effects and finding the right medication that may help you. Um, and I guess I haven't said it, but often in bipolar disorder, medication is um, an important part of treatment. Uh, I wish. I mean, I have a very small, like out of all my patients, there have been very few who could go with totally without any medication. I had like one or two out of you know hundreds of patients. Um, it's unfortunate. Who wants to take medication? Nobody does. But uh, given that reality, that often people who do have a diagnosis of bipolar need medication, um, you can always work with your doctor or other health professional and find, um, find out which medication can help you the most while also uh, minimizing you know, side effects and making it uh, as tolerable as possible and as safe as possible. So then I talked about medication, but but what about psychotherapy? What about talk therapy, and uh, which has been helpful in other mental health problems? So some psychotherapies have been proven to be useful um, as an adjunct, as an add-on to medication in bipolar disorder. So there's cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, that's the kind of therapy where it could be one-on-one -on -one or it could be in a group. And you learn 
about your patterns of thinking and work on ways to change your patterns of thinking and your, your patterns of behaving and seeing how that can improve your mood. Uh, so that's the approach in cognitive behavioral therapy. There's also something called interpersonal and social rhythm therapy. Uh, that's the kind of psychotherapy where a lot of emphasis is put on establishing a good rhythm uh, in your daily life and in your in your social interactions. Often in bipolar disorder, our whole what we call circadian rhythm or our our daily rhythm of life can be out of whack. Uh, we might be awake way late in the night and be asleep during the day. So often, what's found is getting people back on track uh, with having uh, a daily schedule that puts them in contact with, with other people, with their family, friends, and, and uh, caregivers, can get people feeling good again. And then there's something called psychoeducation, uh, where people in a group uh, get, to, get to learn more about bipolar disorder and about how to manage it and about how to live a happy life, even with this diagnosis, which can happen. So these therapies generally work on uh, the number one thing it does is improving how to manage bipolar, what are the signs and symptoms, how can we cope with symptoms that do arise, you know, how do we manage our social kind of interactions with people and uh, any caregivers or family or friends that we have, or even what it's like in, a lot of people don't have so many friends or may not even have any friends. How do we make the best of those situations? How do we reach out for support? And then the other thing is it also helps us improve adherence to medications. Medications are often hard to take. Um, and then we might think, is it working? Is it not? So kind of often these kind of groups can help us learn how to, um, you know, it, it often what I've noticed from, from seeing my own patients is that uh, often treatment is like, treatment is like giving a pill to somebody or uh, or we're kind of saying, okay, do this. But when we become more engaged in um, in our own treatment and our own recovery, it becomes so much more useful. We can really improve our lives. Uh, we can go beyond just calling ourselves uh, some a person with bipolar disorder and say, look, I'm a person. I okay, I have this diagnosis, and you know, I may not agree with this diagnosis. I may not think it's the right one, but finding a way to really engage in treatment. How do I help myself get better? How do I, how do I live a, uh, an active life? But all of these therapies have been studied in younger adults, and they probably need to be studied a bit further in older adults. And so aside from psychotherapy, there are a bunch of other behavioral interventions in older adults with bipolar disorder. So physical exercise, 30 minutes a day can improve mood and prevent memory issues or other cognitive issues. Um, it can really help. My suggestion would be choose something that you enjoy. Uh, ideally, it would have an aerobic component. So stuff like swimming, Zumba, um, you know, I guess some brisk walking. It depends on where you're at. If you've been walking a bit every day, maybe you can up that to something like something more intensive. It's about finding that balance that doing something every day can really help. And then there is uh, something that's recently been found to be helpful, bright light therapy, which has been shown to be helpful in unipolar depression. I think there was one study also in bipolar depression which has found it to be helpful. So I've used that with a few of my patients. They found it to be helpful. Then there are some things like uh, mind-body interventions like Tai Chi and yoga, these could also be helpful for mood and cognition. I mean, in our own, like I, I'm a psychiatrist, I see patients, but I, I also do research. And we, we recently did a clinical trial in, um, in people who were admitted to a hospital in psychiatry. Some of the people did have bipolar. And we found that these kind of interventions were fun and enjoyed. I mean, future research will be needed to find out how effective it is and how to tailor it and really make it very useful. But in the meantime, most patients don't have adverse effects from these kind of interventions. So, so uh, it's something I offer to my own patients. 
um, similarly daily activities like volunteering, doing chores, meeting friends and family, all of that can help. And certainly what I've found is family and social support is very helpful. Uh, very, very helpful to people who have those supports. And even if you don't, there's there are other ways to get that kind of support. Uh, it takes a bit more work, but certainly reach out for help. That's how you can stay healthy. And so even though these are all likely to be helpful in most patients, I think I also need to emphasize that more uh, research is, is needed to validate these, uh, specifically in older age bipolar disorder. But clinically speaking, they're likely to work. So then I'll end with some punchlines, and then we can have some questions. And um, So in terms of punchlines, by 2030, more than half of bipolar disorder patients will be aged more than 60. Bipolar disorder in the elderly requires careful assessment. Uh, an assessment of physical health is essential, both for diagnosis and comprehensive treatment. Uh, since physical health problems are very frequent and associated with the worst quality of life and mortality. Cognitive dysfunction, so decision making um, and memory and other aspects, are frequently observed in uh, late life bipolar disorder and are disabling. And But the good news, I think, is cognitive issues are not necessarily progressive and they could benefit and people could benefit from annual screening just to keep tabs. So if there's a sudden decline in memory or cognition, that's, uh, that's kind of a red flag. But aside from that, um, the good news is usually people have some cognitive issues, but it doesn't tend to be necessarily progressive like Alzheimer's. Um, but it's worth screening every year to check. Medications are almost always needed for treatment. Uh, it's it's a fun, I guess depends on your perspective. Most medications that work in younger adults also work in older adults. Um, lower doses are better tolerated, although sometimes similar doses are needed uh, for treatment effectiveness. Um, psychotherapies and behavioral interventions can also be helpful and can really help treatment. Like medications are one piece of the puzzle but then getting help and learning new tools and living again. That's, that's part, all part of recovery. So I'll take this opportunity to thank you and thanks to all the people who have supported me over the years. Um, and um, yeah, thanks for sticking to the end of at least this part. And I think we'll, we'll have some questions now. Uh, and here's again another slide please uh, support the International Bipolar Foundation. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're here to help you and other people with bipolar disorder and their families. So glad to uh, hear any questions and discussion. All right. Thank you, doctor. Uh, we are going to start with the first question. Uh, do we know why hallucinations and delusions are less common in older adults? That's a good question. Um, I would say it's not really clear, but if we had to guess, people who are older with bipolar disorder are less likely to have mania. And in bipolar disorder, the main uh, time that people have delusions and hallucinations is during mania. So I'm guessing because there's less mania, there's probably less delusions and hallucinations because of that. I see. Thank you for that. Um, let's see. Next question. I am 67 years old and currently have the perfect medications on board to keep me stable. Because of my age, might my medications or medication doses have to change over time? So I guess the question is, does the dose have to change over time? It certainly depends on the medication. Uh, for example, for lithium and for some antipsychotic medications. And over time, and we're talking about, let's say, over, let's say you're 65 or 67, over 20 years, your dose may have to lower um, because, uh, 
for lithium, your kidney function may go down. For for antipsychotics and some of the other medications, there's um, your body has to metabolize or get rid of medications out of the system. So your body tends to metabolize things slower. Uh, as well, you, you body tends to be more sensitive to side effects, like um, cognitive effects, like and some of the medications like antipsychotics can give people some slowing of the, the memory or a slowing of decision making. Um, so as we get older, what's good to do is all, often have a periodic check-in, like at least once a year with your, your physician and ask, look, um, I'm feeling good, but do you think I need to lower any of the meds? And the good news is we tend to get, if, if the medication reductions are needed, there's often an early sign of it. So, for example, for antipsychotic medications, um, someone um, may have some subtle signs of, um, let's say, some stiffness or some tremor or some, or they feel a bit more sleepy than they would have otherwise. So those are some examples of some early signs that your your uh, health professional would pick up on and be like, well, maybe we should lower the meds before you get some serious side effects. Uh, sometimes there are even more subtle versions of those things I mentioned. Um, and then similarly, like for, for example, for lithium, uh, we ask people to measure a kidney function uh, every three months. So that way, if there is a small kind of deterioration, like kidney function gets a bit worse, at, at least you'll pick it up early, and then it will be much more reversible than if you wait you know, a few years. Um, so I think the, in a nutshell, just having close follow-up, and then if there's any sign of any small side effect, that's a sign that perhaps the dose could be reduced. Um, and often, let's say if you're starting a medication for the first time at older age, you often try to, like your, your clinician or your, your doctor will probably start at a lower dose and then very slowly go up cautiously. That's the best way to lower the, the chances of side effects. And if you have a medication that's really worked for you over time, to find a dose that's safe for you as you get older. All right, thank you for that answer. Uh, you briefly mentioned Tai Chi and yoga as behavioral interventions. Are you aware of any evidence supporting the effectiveness of incorporating a mindfulness or meditation practice? So there hasn't been too much research about mindfulness meditation in um, in bipolar disorder. I think there there may be a clinical trial ongoing, um, one or two of them. Um, just personally speaking, I mean, I do um, I I do mindfulness clinical trials in people with unipolar depression um, and people with anxiety, and it has been very effective in those populations. From my clinical experience with uh, with people with older adults with bipolar disorder, it's kind of a mix. There are some people because in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy or mindfulness treatments like that, often people need to meditate for long periods of time, like let's say 30 minutes, which may be a bit too much for someone, uh, for example, uh, who, is, who has a history of psychosis or has had childhood abuse in the past, or even just because of bipolar disorder, it's hard to sit for 30 minutes. There's some people who have that issue. Um, so generally, I would suggest stuff like Tai Chi and yoga in bipolar disorder if you wanted something along the lines of mind-body intervention. But I've, I have had like some, a few patients who started meditating 15 minutes a day. And uh, but I would say if you do try something like that, do it really closely with your your physician, with your clinician, and start very small, even like five minutes meditating a day with with the clinician, keeping in mind that really there hasn't been research done in this area. So although meditation can help people with a number of, med with a number of physical and mental health issues, um, just to keep in mind the research hasn't really been done yet, and that if you do try something like that, do short periods of time with a lot of supervision. Um, and some people do benefit, but I would be very cautious at this point. Okay, thank you for that very helpful answer. Um, the next question is, um, are you aware of any medications that have shown effectiveness for cognitive deficiencies in bipolar disorder in older adults? 
That's a great question. Unfortunately, I think there has been maybe one or two clinical trials on that, and they haven't found anything yet. Um, I, I know that my own group is is trying uh, one. We're doing a medication trial, uh, and one of the things we're looking at is um, cognition. Uh, so far, there isn't a medication that helps uh, cognition by itself. At, at this point, what's known is that pe depression seems to be associated with cognitive problems, and so is mania, but mania is often easier to treat than depression. So medications that tend to help with depression uh, tend to uh, have a better effect on cognition. So for example, lithium and lamotrigine if, and it depends on your own state. Like, the most important thing is being free of um, mania and depression in terms of if you're free of mania and depression, you're more likely to have less of a risk of having cognitive decline. But then let's say if you're in an, a, in an acute episode, let's say you're having acute depressive romantic symptoms and you're, you're with your, your, your doctor and you're trying to decide what do I take, if possible, it's nice to take a medication that doesn't affect cognition too much, like valproate and some of the antipsychotics are associated with some problems. But on the other hand, you can often, by choosing the right dose with your doctor, and it's, it's a conversation, you can often say, look, I'm feeling a bit slow now, or I'm not remembering this, or I'm having trouble making these decisions nowadays. Uh, that can, it's often a matter of maybe, I guess the general approach is finding a medication that works for you ideally finding a dose that, that doesn't affect your cognition too much in a subtle way, so that long-term you prevent that from getting worse. And medications that we do know that are a bit better at cognition, like lithium and lamotrigine, are helpful, but mostly because they prevent remission of depression. Or they, but then again, it's a really on a case-by-case -case basis. Some, you know, a lot of people do benefit from lithium, but then there's some people who really don't, or they found they got a bad uh, adverse effect from it. So it's about finding the medication that works for you. That's number one. And the hope is that in the future we may find things that will help cognition. Uh, aside from medication, though, uh, there are things that do help with cognition, um, like exercise. Exercise really does help with cognition. Um, you know, having intellectual stimulation, so doing stuff like Sudoku or uh, crosswords, taking care of your cardiovascular health, like, like high blood pressure, cholesterol, and diabetes. So each of these things that I just mentioned, blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, exercise, and uh, intellectual stimulation, and even social stimulation, meeting people, saying hi to them, every, well, ideally every day, but even every week is something, and it's a start for a lot of people. Doing these kind of things uh, each of these things can lower the risk of dementia by two times. So um, I guess that's where we're at. We don't have a magic pill yet, but we have a lot of strategies to help and prevent cognitive problems. All right. Thank you for that great answer. Uh, the next question, is there any data that bipolar disorder in older patients gets worse over time? If anything, bipolar disorder... Uh, usually gets a bit easier to manage over time. What happens is a lot of people who have severe bipolar disorder tend to have severe medical problems. And many people, let's say, in middle age, they may have kind of premature death. I mean, not many, like not everyone, and things are really changing nowadays. People are more aware that we need to take care of the physical health and bipolar disorder. So what we're finding in studies is people who do make it, and so people who make it to 65 and up, they tend to be healthier than the people who are, uh, let's say, 40 with bipolar disorder. Maybe they're taking better care of their health. Maybe they were well enough so they survived because there's that 15-year reduced life expectancy. Um, and in terms of the bipolar disorder itself, it seems like there's less mania. There, There is still the cognitive issues and, and the depression, which, which can affect functioning a lot. Uh, but from what I've seen, most of my patients with bipolar disorder, although bipolar disorder still is very difficult to treat in many cases, um, often people have over the years somehow found the medication that works for them, found a way to cope with side effects. 
So often it can be can end up being okay in later life. But the main things to watch out for in later life are really the 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 memory and cognitive issues. Um, to watch out for um, also the physical health problems. And the issue that sometimes arises is because of physical health problems or because of drug interactions or side effects, you have to change to another medication. And that medication may not necessarily be as effective as the one someone's been using for 20, 30 years. So that tends to be a, an issue. But uh, if, we, if we reach out to our healthcare professionals and also take all the help we can, we can, we can make it work. Great. Thank you for that answer. We have time for one final question. Um, the final question is, how do you feel about using supplements as part of your treatment? For example, turmeric. Turmeric. So th this is also a good question. There hasn't been too, too much research, especially not too much research specifically in bipolar disorder about using supplements. Um, there has been some ideas about using antioxidants. So antioxidants tend to be good for you. I would say like antioxidants in daily food are good for you. So eating food that's healthy, that's not too high in fat, that's not too high in sugar, that's not processed. Um, I mean antioxidants are in some types of tea. Um, but eating just generally healthy food, lots of vegetables, lots, that a diet that's now, high in fiber, high in vegetables, fruits. Um, it's a good balanced diet. And either a doctor or a nutritionist could go over that with you. Um, that's probably the, the best way to get the nutrients you need. Um, some people take multivitamins. There's certainly no harm in that. Um, some people take um, something like fish oil. And there has been some research about improved mood with fish oil. Um, there's been one study about something called coenzyme Q. Yeah, I think that's the name of it. Don't, don't. I wouldn't quote me on that, but all that to say, in a, the big picture, I would say eat a healthy diet. Ideally, exercise if you can. If exercise is walking, um, if you're smoking, try to lower the smoking or even stop smoking, and that will help you have less. Um, kind of your body will have less stress you have more antioxidants to, to keep you healthy. And if you're going to supplement, a multivitamin is good, and probably omega-3, like fish oil, is, is good as well. Uh, but has there been a lot of evidence on that? Not so much, but th these are general principles that have been used in, in other conditions. Excellent. Well, thank you for that answer, Doctor. And we're going to go ahead and close the webinar for today. Thank you again for sharing your expertise with us today. And we hope to see everyone at our next webinar. Thank you all so much.